there's a duality that exists in um, the literature when we're talking about different cosmologies, different points of view in, in the big scope and personalities that come about as a, as a part of that. I think what's interesting is that we even see that today with our, our contemporary debates here on, on YouTube and so forth. That is to say, if you were to epitomize uh, the religious versus the non-religious ideas out there into personality types, you have, you have a, a really a, a kind of predictable set of personalities, or so it would seem. William James uh, talked about this in his book that I think is just called uh, Re The Religious Experience or something to that effect, uh, where he likens the, uh, the questioning philosopher type, um, uh, perhaps the, the atheist mindset, um, but, but not necessarily, uh, but that questioning, 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 um, as the sick soul. And his uh, uh, interpretation, of course, William James was a Christian, uh, devout, and that was, that was his, his source of happiness and peace, uh, or, or so he claimed. And he likened historic figures like Marcus Aurelius, who have written meditations, his book Meditations, which I, I talked about on a fairly frequent basis here on the on the channel, as being essentially a a chronicle or a documentation of all these meditations that he had, all these deliberations, and it, it's very hard to get through. It's um it's not an it's not an easy read. Uh, it's really laborious to try to get through it. It was never meant to be published though. But the whole point was, he looks at that the philosopher king where you put basically the the weight of the world on yourself. And uh, you have the notion of, you know, the weight of the world being the, you know, Atlas, the god, uh, the Greek god that, that supported the entire world on his own shoulders. And that whole notion that you have this, this sense of burden and suffering that relates to it. Now, you call it the sick soul. What was William James's uh, prescription to that? What was his alternative? And the alternative, of course, for him was, was faith. And... Um, problem with faith is that the only way that you can believe something that isn't real is to have faith. It's the only way you can do it. It's the only way you can do it. Um, if you believe something just for the time being and, uh, you know, let, let the rest of the world show you one way or the other, uh, in time you'll come around to some better approximation of, approximation of truth by just the matter of, of your experience with life. Faith, however, is the only way that you can remain believing in something that's not true and uh, not do anything about it and not have experience or personal perception or so forth actually challenge it. That's the problem with faith. So we're left with, from a historical standpoint anyway, not many options. You know, we have this, uh, this sort of the sick soul, which, although that was sort of self-glorifying, self-gratifying in his own worldview, I think, uh, being a Christian, the notion that a, a contemplative, pensive soul is just an unhealthy and unhappy one is, I think, pretty much a, a readily accepted premise. If you look at, um, you know, figures in literature, for example, the reason I like that is because literature speaks to the subconscious experience and the sort of collective consciousness experience of things. And I think that's a good place to start uh, because ultimately we have to agree on something if we're going to talk to about things rationally. Do we not? Do we not need to accept the premise? That's the whole point, right? So, literature. Um, a pensive soul, I would remind you of, is uh, Sherlock Holmes. Now, if you've only seen the movies, you probably aren't going to really grasp the full depth, although they, they, they try, um, of what the Sherlock Holmes character is. If you've not read the book, if you have read the books, you know what I'm talking about. He's a very, he's a almost sickly individual. He, um, uh, rabid in his, his, um, and when he's when he's focused, he's like a dog, and and uh, and uh, is is you know nothing else matters. And when he's not focused on the chase, he is this pensive, kind of irritable individual. And uh, if you've not read the books, another example I could think of is the House Doctor House character there on the TV series. They really I think based his entire character off of a Sherlock. Holmes sort of uh, archetype or persona where he is very methodical, very logical, very rationally based and also is somewhat miserable. And uh, the happy people in the world, and you probably see this in your own life, I know I do, the happiest people I meet tend to be religious people. And that's not necessarily evidence 
for or or, or strength to the, the argument of any one particular religion. It really has to do with the fact that, again, faith is the only way that you can continue to believe something that isn't true. There is no other way of doing it. Not one. Not one. Ignorance, even, you know. Willful ignorance that can only go so far until reality smacks you around. But faith, faith will conquer all obstacles in believing something that's not true. Well, with that recognized... That so far, history and the great minds of, of the past have only ascribed dubious things like faith to overcome the um, pensive, dark, sick soul uh, thing that, that William Joseph talks about. We're really left with a bit of a conundrum. We really don't have any other alternative. Um, when I run into situations like this, one thing I like to do is to take take a wider perspective and uh, look outside the culture uh, that that really the, the the problem is born in, and I think in this case it is the Western culture, and look at the East. And in the East, the problem is with uh, the very literal translation of Buddhism, for example, it is merely "don't get your hopes up, and you won't be disappointed," and that's as, it's about as sexy as it really gets. Um, the whole notion of, of enlightenment and, you know, the big pretty lights and that, wow, you're one with the universe and whatever else, those are psychedelic experiences. That's a different, I mean, the whole notion of, of, um, of what we consider enlightenment has been tinted by past experience through, I think, the 60s and 70s where there was that whole, the LSD um, and, and so on, different research and, and the, the really permeated popular culture at the time. And uh, although... You know, I, I've, I've had a very staunch opposition to drug use. I'm sort of, I, I still don't use them myself, but uh, I've become less militant, as I think you do when you get older. And uh, when you think about something long enough, it just, you just, ah, whatever, what the fuck, yeah, go do what you want to do. But anyway, uh, the whole notion of enlightenment from the really traditional sense is that the world is of suffering. Look, the world's shit. Don't get your hopes up. Don't try to hold on to shit that you already have, because it's just going to go away, and you'll be all right. That's the four noble truths, um, basically. And so that's a little disappointing. <laughs> so either we have faith, which is the only way that we can believe something that's absolutely not true and not let experience or anything else discourage us from believing it, or we just have no expectations for life and live in this kind of shell or husk type situation where you never have any high expectations and you never get excited about anything because the world's unpredictable and it is it's true i mean they have a point but is there not something else is there not something else and i think that's really where the uh, modern sense of spirituality is coming from that it's really this sense this this the frustration with um the sort of nihilistic standpoint which either in the west or the buddhism thing was really sort of nihilistic in its own way uh, or the, this notion of this faith-based flashy lights until you see spots in your eyes and, and you, know, you go to church every, every week to reinforce this, this um, subliminal rhetoric just over and over and over and over again because it, that's the only way that it can work is you have to every, every Sunday. And can you tell I don't really think much of a religion? I really, I've never, I, I, I like religion from an academic standpoint. I love I love the stories, I love the mythology of it, but I, I put the, the Bible next to Star Wars and that really pisses people off. But in my mind it makes it makes perfect sense and I believe that's really the way that it should be interpreted. Uh, one, I, I give Star Wars more credit than most people do and the Bible much less credit than a lot of people do. But both are, are elevated texts and in my own view then they can be very insightful. Just not as magical as some people think. So what is the in-between? Where do we go? What is, the, um, what is our contemporary modern-day approach to this duality of either being the happy-go-lucky ignorant type, the faith-based worldview, or being the person that is lost in their own pensive tendencies, who is interested in bettering themselves, bettering their families, people around them, the world at large, perhaps, but are ultimately frustrated because I know some of you feel the same way. I really do. And uh, I've seen that with comments as well and other videos. And, and it really it doesn't offend um, intuition or logic, really, or, or expectation that, yeah, there are frustrated people out there. What do we do? Do we create a new religion? Do we change our attitude towards religion? Do we reinvoke um, 
this the notion of myth and the Jungian perspectives that we talk, take a look at these um, subconscious archetypes that we see in in story and start speaking about things in that sort of connotative instead of denotative way. Uh, do we do we find it in art? Do we become artists ultimately? Is that where culture is, is destined to become artists? Is it because if it's if it's to become scientists, that's the problem with science. Oh oh, rambling. Oh oh my God, so many Stasis. I'm sorry. Yes, so many different points here. Uh, the problem with science by itself as a worldview is that it is a subset of philosophy. You really need to give it the fuck over yourself because the way that that um, science works is you have philosophic presuppositions and I you know I've, I've beaten this in the face until it's been bloody into a pulp and a lot of people have on YouTube it's not just me but the problem is when you try to perpetuate an entire society I mean with it that implies a value system and all these sort of like sociological soft science bullshit that the real hard atheists and the, the hard mechanicalists would like to do away with you find yourself implying value systems without actually addressing them as thoroughly as those soft sciences do um, that is to say that if you were to look at Jacques Fresco, for example, with his whole idea of the Venus Project, he would like you to believe that it's an entire universe, or entire society rather, uh, based on the scientific method and decisions are just made because they're just made. While at the same time, underhandedly, um, he talks about shoulds and oughts, and you can't do that in a scientific worldview. You, 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 there's no should, there's no ought, there just is, there's an is. But um, when there's a question of shortages with resources and deciding who gets what, that's a matter of should. That's a philosophic question. And believe it or not, Jacques Fresco, you know, the person who wants to solve everything by the scientific method, is describing shoulds and oughts, but really smuggling them in. He doesn't really address them in, in full sweeping philosophic terms. And in fact, um, what's her name? The, the female uh, sidekick of that, what's her name? Uh, anyway, oh, Roxanne Meadows um, has said, you know, the great thing about Jacques is he's not a philosopher. He's just, he just does shit. Well, okay, well, yeah, okay, fine. But, but you can't change the world without changing the value system. You know, this is, I guess this is, this has really kind of been my meme here for the past couple videos, is that we must acknowledge the two sides of, of reality and of, of being a human, the logical and the subconscious. We must be both the scientist and the artist. The Renaissance man needs to, to make a resurgence, reappearance, resurgence, whatever, um, needs to come back and permeate culture. That needs to be the cool thing again. You need to be able to uh, play music while also balance equations. You know, you need to understand how to, to uh, execute a flawless, double-blind, totally randomized scientific study while at the same time know how to write goddamn good poetry. And it's, it's lacking. It's lacking in the world. And it's not just to make you well-rounded, you know, so you can, you know, impress your grandparents, you know, who seem to have a value for that kind of thing. But to recognize that you are part of both of those worlds. That's why you have to be real, real well-rounded. Because you are a subconscious mind and you are a conscious mind. The conscious mind is the math, the science, and uh, the logic of the world. Subconscious mind, it's myths, it's stories, it's art, it's, um, it's, it's the implications that we get and the sensations we get off of the perception of relationships where the points themselves can be measured and so forth and described in the, in the logical mind, it is then felt and experienced through the subconscious mind. Because after all, every experience you've ever had has been a mental experience. You've never had a physical experience. It's all been mind. It's all been mind. It's all been a mental experience. That's not to say that there's only mind. It just means that if there is anything besides your own perception, you've never had any experience of it. And um, isn't that important enough to try to figure out? No. Isn't that enough reason to try to um, actualize oneself? You know, the whole Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We get the bottom bit, you know, food, water, shelter. But what is that, what is that shit at the top? Self-actualization. What does that really mean? I believe it means to acknowledge and to foster, to nurture and nourish the conscious and the subconscious aspects of the self.